As we look back over the history of mankind, we note a number of interesting but generally ignored facts. In fact, a lot of people who are very contemporary in their thinking would like to have these things from the past permanently ignored and to assume, if possible, that new conditions and the new world way of life will take care of the past and all the lessons that it would teach us. Unfortunately, this is not true. And we have all been faced again and again, and are still being faced, perhaps as never before, with a lot of unfinished business that has descended to us, really, from prehistoric times. The first thing we have to consider, for instance, is humanity itself. We think of the humanity as a kind of an intangible collective. But actually, today, it is four and a half billion people, nearly all of whom are dedicated to one essential objective, and that is to do exactly as they please. They will support only that which supports them. They do not wish to have anyone interfere with their inalienable right to live out the pattern which they have established inside of themselves or have inherited from the past. Now, this problem is not easily solved. We not only have all these people, but according to one re reference recently noted, there are 1,700 different languages and dialects we have to deal with among these people. We also find they are divided into many races, sub- and sub-races, into nations, tribes, communities. This mass of human beings has never been brought together in any kind of an harmonic pattern. The ancients did not even know neighbors outside of their own boundaries. And uh, within the uh, boundaries, these ancient countries had one trouble after another. And the earth today is dotted frequently with the ruins of cities destroyed by the wars of neighbors. We have inherited all of this strange complication, a complication of people, each one of whom is an individual. Now, his individuality level may not be particularly high in all cases, but he is still an individual. He has his own inner life. He has his beliefs. Perhaps he borrowed them from his ancestors. Perhaps he inherited them from his educators, but he has them. And these ideas and these attitudes make him separate from practically all other human beings. If he wants friends, he selects others of similar general convictions. But even in the case of friendships, no two friends, though they are compatible, are identical. Thus we have this tremendous mass of humanity. More recent developments and progress, progressive discoveries have given us a closer relationship with all these other people. This mass is now bound together with airplane routes, uh, with industrial treaties, uh, with political structures, with all kinds of man-made devices, hopefully intended to improve the conditions of these people. Actually, however, the great problem just remains as it was, something that we have never been able to work with uh, satisfactorily. This great human power, this great mass of human ingenuity and inventiveness is pouring one discovery after another into our world of learning. But each of these individuals is himself trying to advance his own purposes. Well, at the comparatively early time, it became apparent that these various groups could not simply wander about. There had to be some kind of leadership, and leadership became the problem of antiquity and remains so to our time. Who were the leaders? Well, as we go back perhaps to the very earliest time, 
the tribal chieftain, the elder, even may, maybe venerated dead, had power of leadership. In any event, there was some kind of an overstructure in which the oldest, the wisest, the strongest, or the most ambitious became the leader. And having gained this leadership, staked the territory and defended it. When his leadership was a little more secure, he began to eye enviously other people's territories. And he used his people to contribute to his own ambition for spreading his domain. This leadership problem also has many interesting variations. Naturally, we can assume that a tribe had to have a tribal father or a tribal leader. Uh, this was necessary because there had to be some way of artificially holding a group together. Possibly the earliest form of this was a combination of the tribal chief and the priest. A religious leader who had no political power, but maintained that political power in another person. All this went on from time to time. In some countries we had one type of leadership and some another. Probably one of the most progressive we ever had was right here on this continent, the Great League of the Iroquois, which came to a very dy dynamic decision. And the leaders of the Iroquois nation were all women. And the women instructed the senators or sachems how to vote. Of course, a little of that goes on now, but less obviously. <laughs> anyway, that was one way of solving it. And it did bring about a harmony between seven different nations or tribes of Indians. Others had variations on the theme. All had some way of trying uh, to uh, control or direct or organize people. Now, in order to do this successfully, you had to have laws. And, of course, the problem of laws has also become more and more confounded as the ages passed. The great laws of the earliest time were presumably divinely inspired. They were attributed, at least, to deity. It was assumed, therefore, that obedience to these laws constitute obedience to God. There was the Mosaic Code, the Decalogue. Then there was the additional Christian creed that was added to this at the Council of Nicaea. There was the Code of Hammurabi long ago, the Code Justinian, the Code Napoleon, and today more or less the Code Chaos. <laughs> These different codes were intended to regulate conduct. Now most people in different parts of the world, whether it was the Indians with the laws of Manu, or the Buddhists with their sutras, or the Chinese with their Confucian uh, moral logs, moral logs, these different systems were sufficient to do a great deal of good. And it gradually worked its way into the inner part of the individual that in some way these laws were essentially right. This probably was due to the fact that down deep inside of humanity there was a level of unity that has seldom been explored. On the surface and on the objective side of life, everyone is different. But somewhere in the subjective side, the invisible causal sphere of things, there is a great deal more uniformity, a great deal more uh, unity of purpose and conviction. Out of the various codes that have been given over the last several thousand years, there has developed what we might term a morality. This morality has stood the test of time. It is, so to say, proven that it was necessary to the salvation of human society. We now recognize the Ten Commandments as rather necessary. Whether we like them or not, whether we wish to obey them or not, we discover that conditions get worse to the degree that we disobey them, and that what little formal integration we have in society is based largely upon allegiance to a moral code. Now, this moral code has also changed in the course of time. 
In early days, morality was a local issue. Each nation had its own concepts of right and wrong. Today, however, with the communication systems that we have, morality has become worldwide, and we begin to think of it in terms of human rights. We think of it in the fact that all human beings must survive by the same general pattern, and that variation from this pattern can be fatal. It is possible, of course, that these different convictions and patterns of morality can be adapted to local conditions, but still the great pattern seemingly cannot be ignored, and anything or anyone who tries to ignore it comes to great troubles in the end. Nearly every disaster in history that has involved human activity has resulted from breaking the commandments. Somebody thought they were bigger than the law. Someone wanted more than their share. Someone decided to uh, temper the plowshare back into a sword. Always the mistake was to break the laws that humanity had recognized from the beginning. So when we come now to our modern situation, we have inherited thousands of years of discords. We have inherited a, several very good codes of moral integrities. We have also come to a little better level of insights than our ancestors. We think we know more. We have more opportunities, more privileges, more conveniences, more innovations of knowledge than ever before. So there is a certain smugness about us. We do not want to look back again upon those old days when things were not as wonderful as they are now. But the no another look gives us another realization that we are in greater danger today than in the, those times when things were less opulent. The more we have gained of knowledge, the more we have endangered our own survival. And with nuclear fission, we've rather put the capstone on the whole thing. We have done that which apparently violates some law of some kind, not made by man, but inherent in the universal structure of which we are a part. We have not yet recognized the importance of going back uh, to the great pattern of life itself, nature, the universe, to find the laws that are best for the advancement of human society. So we are making a number of very bad mistakes. And we are making them largely not because we have to make them, but because we choose to. Now in these days, we are very anxious over political situations. We are much concerned over whether or not our political leadership is adequate. And most people who are in trouble will be very quick to blame leadership. Whereas leadership, in turn, may be a little inclined to blame the people. But in any event, uh, the problems that re exist and dominate us at the present time indicate that leadership as we have it is not adequate. The next question is, why and how could we find a better or more adequate leadership? And I think the answer to that is, we're not going to. In other words, we're not going to find better leadership because it has to come out of the same tank with the rest of us. Unless an archangel descends in full glory, we are going to have to continue to develop means of governing ourselves more adequately. Now, one way, of course, to develop leadership is to strengthen character. And here we come on an interesting subject of the philosophical turn. Uh, according to the Oriental peoples, Buddhists and Hindus, particularly ancient Hinduism, there's a kind of a saying that the human being has to die hundreds of times in order to learn to live once. And that, more or less, indicates the idea that the only way we're going to solve this problem is by gradually becoming weary of making the same mistakes. We're going to gradually learn that the way we've been doing things doesn't pay, doesn't produce any of the results that we so desire and covet. But, of course, if you happen to be a materialist, 
and do not believe that we are going to return to this sphere at some later time, then we have a more complicated problem because the materialist must accomplish all of it in one lifetime. He must rise from superlative ignorance to superlative wisdom in 60, 70, or 80 years. Well, it's very doubtful if we're going to find very many persons who can really accomplish this. And those who make a great success of it are usually assassinated. Because the moment we begin to think above the level of the many, the many turns on us. So we have this problem of leadership and how we're going to get it. We have this problem of looking around for the perfect parental figure. What we need is the all-wise leader, all-loving, unselfish, untouched by personal ambitions, uncorrupted by opportunity. The individual who lives solely and totally for our good. This is very fine, except each different group of people has a different image of this person. Each, in, with his own interests, wants this leadership to specialize in his needs. And as these needs are often in dramatic conflict with each other, the situation again is not entirely satisfactory. Every once in a while, however, we have a burst of some kind, a desperate effort, uh, to create a better cultural level. We had that experience <coughs> in the 19, in the 19, around 1918, when we put through the Volstead Act, prohibition. We decided we were going to save the average American citizen from alcoholism. It was a noble experiment, and we had to rescind it almost immediately. The, be, the answer being that the individuals whom we were hoping to save simply used bootleggers and set up one of the worst crime empires the world has ever known. Because the individual said, if I want to drink, I'm going to drink. And if I can't get it legally, I will get it illegally. So what are we going to do about this? We got bootleggers. Now, there is no doubt in the world that since that time, we have become more and more conscious of the dangers of alcoholism. But we have an upsurge of it now associated with the more dangerous implements and instruments of our social and mechanical age. Today, we are desperately worried over the problems of well, alcoholism and car driving. Accidents are mounting tremendously. And we have no answer for it. There'd be no answer. You can uh, uh, say, well, we put them in jail. So they'll go to jail. But when they come out, they'll keep on drinking because they have the inalienable right to do what they please. And the purpose of the government is to please the inevitable and inalienable rights of 250 million human beings, each one of which has a somewhat different code as to what is an inalienable right. So it's pretty serious and pretty difficult and pretty disappointing. Now we can go to another field of activity. Here we are in the 20th century, one of the best educated countries in the world, and narcotics. We are trying some way to find how to prevent narcotics being imported into this country. The problem of trying to prevent this is probably beyond our possibility of to solve. We can slow it down, we can catch a number of these uh, uh, ca carriers and messengers, but the continued condition will prevail, because certain people want to do it. And they will fight to do it, and certain other people will legislate to keep on doing it because of the immense profits involved. And between the individual who wants what he wants, and another individual who wants to make as much money as he can, the problem is not going to be easily solved. And the fact that thousands of persons uh, die from alcoholism or narcotics, and we see it everywhere in the schools and everywhere else, the individual still wishes to do what he wishes to do. And any law to prevent this is tyranny. And it will be no more than introduced before some will rise in mighty wrath to dispose of the law. 
it will be either watered down to nothing or some special uh, group will see that it gets nowhere. This is what happens all the way along. Armament, everything else. Among the sufferers are the United Nations, most of whose delegates have only the good of their own group in mind, and perhaps not even that. And the sincere ones are simply bowled over in the excitement and in the uh, frustration of the whole situation. The answer then becomes pretty obvious. And that answer is that it's not going to be done by placing a government over people. Uh, in a family, now we get down to personal relationships. A parental situation exists. A parental relationship, however, today is weakening constantly. Children can hardly wait to get away from parental guidance. They consider any correction for their excesses or their attitudes to be tyranny. They are resolved and determined to do exactly what they please. And many of them are paying for this attitude with their lives, their sanity, and their health. But they are going to do it their way. A strict parent today is unpopular not only with his own family, but with the whole society in which he lives. Because we live in a society that is given over very largely uh, to compromise and to letting things drift along as they are. And yet when they drift into trouble, then we're all worried. There seems to be no problem that we can face directly. Now the answer will have to ultimately be what it was in the first place and will always remain. We are here to learn. <coughs> we are here to grow by experience. And furthermore, we're, we are here to learn to become self sustaining and self-guiding human beings. The only answer for, as to what our problems are today is the realization that the individual is the, you know, the element of the cause and the actual element of the cure. The individual has to do it. Now we may say that that's a long, slow process. It is because we are so late in getting started at it. But it still remains that nearly every corruption or abuse of society can be corrected if private citizens do not contribute to that abuse or refuse to sustain it. Instead of trying to get something voted in by a group that will never be able to make it work even if they voted in, if the individual who doesn't like something sacrifices any pleasures he may get from this abuse, and stands firmly for principles that are correct. We will find that in, in integrity, we have the only answer to our problem. But at the moment, integrity is in short supply. Very much so. Nearly every factor that we know in society today is, society today is compromising integrity. It is choosing, rather, the course of least resistance. Integrity to many people means poverty. To many other people it means frustration. Integrity means the dismal and incredibly hard thing of doing what is right. This is just too much for the average individual to contemplate. And even if he doesn't wish to contemplate, he feels he has a vicarious excuse. Why should he work so hard when no one else is? When his neighbors are all exploiting each other, why should he be the only one who does not make something out of it? So the uh, compromises go on and on and on. But the integrity of the person is the one thing that no dictator can stand against, that no corrupt system can uh, change. The mass of humanity is the vox populace. It is the voice of God. And if it speaks correctly, problems will be solved. But if it keeps quiet and continues to cater to problems, they will never be solved. All over the world today, aggressive leaders, dictators, and so forth, are destroying people. They are corrupting ethical systems. They are tearing down religious convictions. They are doing everything possible to make the private citizen helpless. 
They want to take away from him any security of his own inner life and make him completely dependent upon a highly organized society which has the power to destroy him at any moment he chooses. Now this is not possible to the person who really intends to do something with his own life. And I think for those who are religiously oriented and philosophically inclined, we must recognize the importance of at least a moderate effort uh, to release ourselves from the despotism of our own appetites. If we do not do this one of these days, it's just to be too late, at least for this culture. We're going to destroy something we've been thousands of years building. And a lot of people today are of the opinion that it cannot be prevented, that this destruction is going to come. It is going to come as long as we are looking for perfect leadership to carry us out of it. What we have to look for is the power within ourselves to defend our own integrities against the pressure of circumstances. Now, no one's going to be perfect. We don't ask anyone to be a martyr or something of that kind. But in many ways, we can begin day by day to improve a situation that we do not believe in or claim we do not believe in. Right now, the television industry is tied up in a mess. It is being uh, divided into a number of private channels, many of which are being devoted largely to pornography. Now, there is a law, there are laws being suggested, and of course, the moment we suggest that we improve the morality, there's a great cry goes up that we mustn't do things like that. The individual has an inalienable right to watch filth if he wants to. It's true. And the uh, private uh, stations with this type of program will continue to flourish and will have a large following unless we as private citizens turn them off. As soon as these patients do not have the financial support of people who say they want something better and then settle for something worse, as soon as the individual censors his own likes and dislikes, industry will answer. You can't legislate a correction as to what constitutes pornography. But each individual can decide what is good or bad taste and turn off the program. And if enough do that, the problem is solved. But it will never be solved from the top. We can elect anyone we want to do it, but it will never be done until we do it ourselves. And if we try to do it by force, we will simply turn it into the underground, and there it will remain as a sore within the system. The individual has, out, has to outgrow the attitudes which make these corruptions possible. And it's the same in almost every profession and every way of life. The individual who believes in principles, who has integrities within himself that he wants to sustain, must really go to work and live them. He must believe that his religion and his philosophy have something to do with his conduct. That if he believes in, in values, if he believes he is spiritually oriented, he must live accordingly. If he wants to see a better world, he must help to build it. He cannot wait for some great personality to come along and save the world for him. Until he deserves it, he shouldn't be saved. Until the person is willing to correct his own faults, he should not hope for securities but he's hoping that some kind of legislative integrity will take care of him. It won't, because the very legislators working on this level are themselves insecure. They have not them themselves proper integrations. So we need say that integrity is in rather short supply, and that is exactly what we mean. We find, as you all have found, Increasing difficulty in finding honest labor, uh, properly labeled goods, reasonable prices, and a willingness to meet uh, the needs of peoples in a really religious manner. We are a nominally religious and a nominally Christian world, here at least, and most of Europe, 
and it is a very t- much time now for us to begin to practice it. But the practicing of it is difficult because we have locked ourselves in a luxury system which we want to defend at all costs. We are quite unable to consider breaking down the barriers of expense which we ourselves have built up. We go to see the ball game, and we suddenly discover that it may cost us $50 for a ticket. We also learn that uh, some of the players are getting a million or two a year. Now, this is not necessary. We could correct this condition in almost no time by simply saying what the as people we think is a reasonable figure and not varying from it for any reason. Certainly, it may break up a system, but a system which itself is so unfair might as well be broken up because it is not in harmony with civilization or the survival of humanity. All exploitation is unreasonable, and it nearly all centers upon private citizens. And until these private citizens simply say we will not be exploited, the condition will remain. If, however, we do say, when the price is right, we'll buy. When the goods are correct, we will think about it. Uh, When we are fairly treated, we will cooperate. On this basis, it would not be long before there'd be a major change in most human relationships. And this could be very well carried into the problem of military objectives. The whole idea of the military is simply the use of the power of the people uh, to advance the ambitions of a few. And this situation goes on as long as the people will do it. Everything goes on as long as we remain in status quo. As long as our own integrities are not offended, there is nothing we're going to do about it. Now, what are the integrities that are most valuable to us at this particular time? One of the most important integrities is self-discipline. Without this, nothing is going to happen. Self-discipline is the power to regulate our own conduct. It is the possibility of living within our own means. It is the uh, answer to the question of extravagance, by means of which a great part of our economic problem has developed. Self-discipline is the individual preferring to do what is right and quietly refusing to compromise his own principles. If we do not compromise our principles, and enough people remain reasonably honest, there would be a major change in our world affairs almost immediately. Now, for some reason, this particular thought has not gotten into the school system. And yet there is no place where the life of reason should be taught more completely. Young people should be taught that they are not intended simply to become uh, a a parasites or become parasites on the cultural system to which they belong. Young people should be taught to be industrious, thoughtful. They should be taught to be kind and honorable. And with all the reading, writing, and arithmetic, I think that uh, we should have a definite course in every public school upon basic integrities and what happens when you break them and the horrible examples are plentiful to show. Uh, I noticed uh, when I was in Japan the last time, uh, I saw a, a plan for educational expansion among the Japanese public school system. And the main subject in the grammar school grades is in the following order. Integrity, reading, writing, and arithmetic. In high school, integrity, uh, algebra, and so forth. In the universities, integrity, physics, biology, and chemistry. Always the first course was integrity. Now, we can't say that they all live up to that either. We can't say anything like that. But for some mysterious word, in some way, they seem to be outcircling us in a number of directions. If their integrities are causing them to make better products, then we need their integrities immediately also. Because we cannot solve a problem by shutting out 
the honest labor of someone else in order to defend this honest labor of our own. We've got to be as honorable as the person we deal with. And out of that we can have a new relationship in life that is highly important and highly valuable. And in the dangerous age of, of us, of our young people, the integrities are very, very vital. We see every day the lack of leadership, and we see the disregard for leadership. Now, this disregard for leadership is also available to us for observation in national affairs. One government after another is falling. They're falling so much that it seems as though they are like autumn leaves every year. They're just dropping. Because they are unable to control their people, and they are unable to decide on problems and on policies. The same is true in the family. Parents are losing control of their children. The people are turning, the children are turning from them. They are developing objectionable habits and no one can do anything about it. I know a case recently in which a parent tried to correct a child for a very obvious delinquency and the child simply walked off and left home. This is the type of thing we are developing and there is no integrity in it. There is no effort of the individual to establish his own place in the plan of life. Actually, as far as we know, man is the most advanced visible form of life on the planet. He has the most privileged. He has the interior capacities for the most wonderful achievements in almost every field of life, in art, in music, in culture, literature, in science, philosophy, religion, all of these fields. He has the mental and emotional equipment to make valuable contributions. He has also within his nature a power of self-analysis. He can examine his own life. He can see what he's doing. He can contemplate the consequences of his own conduct. He has been equipped with a power to censor his own action. He is capable of knowing right from wrong in his own action and activity. He is not dependent upon someone else telling him. The human being is probably the most gifted creature that we will ever hear of in the course of our immortal existences. He is magnificently adapted to a tremendous destiny, and he is just throwing it away. He is throwing it away on things which are not worthy of him and uh, which contribute nothing to his own good or the good of the society to which he belongs. Therefore, the problem is that the human being must grow up. There must be more strain of maturity appear. There's got to be something to indicate that we have passed a period of adolescence in which there was nothing in the world but fun. We also have to get over the idea that there is infinite money to do anything we want to with. All these ideas are the result of bad thinking and lack of facts. They are the result of the individual simply falling into an emotional network of appetites. If he continues with it, he will see the ruin of his world. But with a little hard thinking and a little hard work, we also have the ever-present remedy that no one could take away from us. And that remedy is the power to heal ourselves, to cure the ailments in our own natures which have brought us to this emergency. Man has the power to outgrow his own weakness. He has the natural ability to grow into his own maturity. And by doing this, and by achieving in these areas, he has the right to solve his problems. So we're going on now from day to day. Everybody's got a little bit of an idea of some kind. A lot of people are trying hard. They're all working with the idea we can only get a group of people to see it. It's not only that... It's not that primarily we've got to get the individual himself to see it. Then he can form groups. But to form groups out of people by merely word of mouth conversion in which all the members remain just what they were before <coughs> and make the same mistakes they've been making for ages is not going to solve anything. Solution lies in the individual forming a group because he himself not only understands the problem, but can prove clearly that he is personally applying what understanding he does possess to his own daily living. If he is still nagging with his neighbors, 
he's not a good candidate for membership in the United Nations. If he cannot get along with races or religions, he's not a good candidate for any type of organization that is seeking to unite dissonant factions. If he's full of prejudice, social, religious, or cultural, if his antagonisms go through every stratum of society, and if he loves to argue almost any subject that comes along, always in terms of benefit to himself, then he is not a good candidate for anything. It's no use putting millions of those people together. <laughs> because the only thing you might be able to gain by that would be the one rather perhaps helpful thought that large numbers of them would exterminate each other. <laughs> and this might be a solution to something. Perhaps overpopulation. But it would be no answer to anything. The problem is that the housewife, the child, the businessman, the parent, the leaders in every smaller field of activity, the scoutmaster and his uh, members of his little group, all these people have got to live it. They've got to move into a world in which they begin to forgive each other their faults and build upon a common ground. They've got to be very careful to make sure that when they make a promise, they keep it, even the most simple thing. They must be sure that when they weigh the pound, they do not weigh their thumb with it. They've got to do the thing correctly. They've got to be honorable and honest. And when they have a day's work, they can't spend half of it walk, time walking around doing nothing. No person of the, with these weaknesses can contribute to the improvement of the society to which he belongs. And yet it is the individual who is the only source of that improvement. If he does not improve, society will not. No matter of, uh, no matter of education will solve it, uh, the situation. Some of the best educated people today are the worst rogues. And will continue to do so, as they do. Education gives them skill in deceit. And there is no answer to this except the development of a corresponding integrity in themselves. And, of course, this is a considered a rather dangerous thing, for on some level levels at least, and any effort to improve integrity will be opposed. If you form a group to prove conclusively that you'd like a better way of doing something, someone will come along to break up that group. It is inevitable. But there's not much anyone can do to break up humanity. If individuals quietly, personally, and in their own lives live better, the result is an almost invulnerable situation. Nothing can really stand against it very long. The only thing that, we, that can be done is to have someone go out and try to propaganda the opposite. But this in turn becomes more and more difficult as people think about the problems we're in. It is awfully difficult today to propaganda anything in defense of the way we're doing things now because the average person is thoroughly disillusioned with the situation and is not going to be easily over-influenced. Now, in our religious and philosophical way of life, there are a lot of, many other things that become very useful and helpful and well worth thinking about. It is very valuable to realize that there is a rather healthy core of younger people today with positive religious dedications. They are young people who are green, they are not uh, mature, they are not thoroughly responsible in every way, but they are idealists, they are dedicated, they are striving to do something to break away from corruption. And they are using various religious devices to help them with this. They are small, forming small religious communities which no one is paying too much attention to because the average person doesn't realize the potential in them. If these groups are sincere, honorable, and keep their integrities, uh, they can sh show the way uh, to a utopian possibility that we all ought to know more about. We also realize that out of these types of things are coming cooperatives of one kind or another, of people working together, of swapping, and of barter, and of gradually escaping the deadly pressure of, the, of an economic situation. The average individual is in prison to economics just as though he was in jail. He doesn't dare to move 
because it will upset the mysterious balance of economics. So he does nothing to, in a desperate effort to leave things the way it is, and by doing nothing, he completely upsets everything. There's no way out of this type of situation except for the person to begin to take over his life. Now, we all have problems in family, friendship, business, all these things, but we can gradually uh, improve our relationships. Now, we're going to be disappointed in some instances. Let's face it. We're going to try to do nice things for people, and they're not going to appreciate it, and they're going to criticize and condemn us for doing them. But this not too, not too important. important. They've always condemned the individual who tried to help them. Therefore, the, the uh, person who is trying to help realizes this. He is not going to be discour- discouraged by the fact that he does not immediately att- attain uh, the goal which he hopes. The best point, the best point to consider is that regardless of whether it's received or rejected, a good deed is a responsibility of the individual who does it. He has to do it. If he doesn't have to do it, society fails. So little by little, there can come through this something that is against the corrosion that we are suffering from. And this thing that has to come into it is integrity. Integrity is the basis of all human relationships. It is the basis of confidence. It is the foundation for family uh, strength and unity. It has to do with every phase of labor and capital and management. The integrities are the things upon which civilization can be built. When we know what is right and we do it, we are going to succeed. But if we know what is right and we do not do it, we are going to fail. Because this rightness relates to a universal situation and not to ourselves. Integrities are, according to us, a a kind of moral values. But in the infinite pattern of things, integrities are the immutable laws of space. In some mysterious way, every integrity is involved in the actual creation and function of the universe. Integrities are the dependabilities of things. The fact that we are reasonably certain that the sun is going to rise tomorrow morning is one of the integrities. We, we trust it because we know it will happen. Now, there are invisible integrities that are just as strong. There are the, all kinds of values in life which we discover by, de, by calling upon them in time of need. Among the integrities, the greatest and most important, socially speaking, is cooperation. And this cooperation we find everywhere in space. There is no competition in the cosmos. Everything has to work together in order to maintain that splendor which we call a galaxy. There can be no competition in the human body. Uh, The different systems and the different parts of the human body, the blood, all of these elements, do not cooperate. Man is dead. It is not possible for competition to survive. Nor can one organ raise a flag and say, I'm going to take over the body. That also is fatal. And anarchy in the body is fatal. And the overgrowth of one unit against the rest can be fatal. Cooperation is the secret of the human body's function. And over that cooperation is something we call the mind, or the intelligence of the person. And having passed through a number of stomach aches, and maybe had considerable medical expense, that mind begins to think in terms of taking care of that body, rather than being the victim of its abuses. Now, the same thing has to happen in the larger world of things. The individual has wars, pestilences, earthquakes, tidal waves, and every type of dangerous natural phenomena. He must gradually wake up to the meaning of these things. He must discover how... The parts of the universe cooperate with each other 
and that this cooperation is a great archetype. It is the supreme textbook of all things. And it's written in various living forms from the most gigantic uh, nebula somewhere in space to the tiniest atom on the back of a flea. It is all under law. There is no more magnificent structure in the world than the eye of a fly. It is all a tremendous over-integration, an integrity, a complete lawfulness that manifests on every plane of nature. The only exception to this lawfulness is man's determination to be different. And when he tries to be different, he doesn't realize the divine edict to be different is to die. There is no way in which the individual is going to outwit the universe. There's no way that he can do wrong and have the benefits that nature bestows upon that which is obedient. The uh, small animal learns from the time of its birth to obey. It learns from the parent who speaks nothing, but leads the way by conduct. It knows gradually the laws of its kind. Man must learn the laws of his kind. And his laws, are strangely, are more simple than any other, because he is the most adequately equipped to solve problems. Many creatures live and die without knowing what their problems are. Man, however, has the capacity to know. He can learn the, the tremendous value of living in a cooperative relationship with life around him, with its natural resources, with its ecology, with all of the different aspects of relationships and interrelationships. The human being can learn the law. And having learned it, he can keep it. And the law that he keeps will keep him. There is no reason why the human being's education should not be founded upon the great ethical <coughs> structure that is, supports the cosmos. There is no scientist, no physicist, no astronomer, no biologist or chemist who can deny this tremendous integrity in space. In fact, the research people in all fields depend upon it every day. It is the fact that they know that their experiments will work according to natural law that they go on. And they know there will be no exception to these laws. And if the, if the experiment doesn't work, it is because the human being has mistaken the technique. So all the way along, we have an integrity that tells us how to exist. Now, this integrity has been working on us in a number of different ways. Now we have another phase of it coming into, into in condition. We are a small planet, rather insignificant in the large scheme of things. Uh, Mark Twain called us the wart, and uh, perhaps that's what we are. But anyway, we're here, and every day there are more of us here. Little by little... The wandering tribes have consolidated, magnified, multiplied. One of these days, maybe not in our lifetime, but someday, we're going to be inhabited from layer after layer of the Earth's surface. We're going to have no place to lie down even, if the present procedure goes on. We're going to find ourselves uh, gradually in a planet, the resources of which we have completely wasted we will find that our way of life, our, ca our indifference to values, that in one war we can waste enough petroleum to take care of our needs, maybe for a hundred years, all of these things will have to come home to us. We are the ones who are very foolish. Instead of conserving our resources, we waste them for profit when we should conserve them for use. And if we don't come around to this one of these days, we're going to be out of resources. Then we're all going to get very excited. One's going to say there's no God who would permit this to happen. Another one will say it is God and he's going to wipe us out. <laughs> Somebody else says, oh, I was just foolish and my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And gradually we may find a tremendous shattering of what could have been a magnificent structure. There's still time to do something about it, but the handwriting is definitely on the wall. 
We're not going to be able to continue this way forever. But perhaps some hope that they will be able to continue this way as long as they live, and then they're out of it. Well, perhaps the Oriental mind is correct. Instead of being out of it, they're going to have a vacation and back right into it again and face all the things that they caused 500 years earlier. There seems to be something in nature that should say you don't get away from problems until you solve them. <coughs> if you uh, hope to die to get away from a mistake, you're going to be born just in time for the mistake to catch up with you again. <laughs> This doesn't make good sense, nor does it make good sense in an ethical universe that an individual by dying can escape from anything. Now, we don't follow the idea that man passes from here into perdition and that he's going to be hounded around by little red devils with pitchforks. Maybe the heck, the hell that he's worried about, about getting into, it means that what's going to happen when he comes back here? Maybe when he's reborn here, this is it. And it's going to be it until he does something about it. He's going to be born back into the imperfections to which he contributed. <coughs> He's going to be forced to continue to do the job until he does it right. And this situation is something that is to be given very serious thought by people today. Now, so we say today we have meditation exercises and we have all kinds of groups with spiritual convictions and spiritual aspirations. Now, a good many of them, however, have a basic weakness. They're all expecting somebody else or something else to do the job. They do not expect to be the one who must clean the thing up. They are waiting to call upon hierarchies or something else to come down and save us. Well, there may be some truth in that, too. But I think even the, the best hierarchy would like to see a little better work done here. I think it, it's being hardly within the religious uh, concept of universal integrities that any spiritual power should reward the individual for being wrong, or that should take away from him the consequences of his own conduct. So whatever happens, we better start now. If there are superior powers that want to come in and help, let us provide them with adequate vehicles to do so. Let us give our own selves as instruments to a purpose. <coughs> instruments in the sense of conditioned people, thoughtful and dedicated. Persons who have risen above prejudice and political explosiveness and have settled down to the problem of trying to work out a better way of life for humanity. Now everywhere, here and there, very hopeful signs are appearing over the edge of things. There are steps being taken, and little by little the improvement is coming. But whether it can be made to come fast enough very largely depends upon the individual himself starting out to correct his own conduct. Let's say, for instance, that a person who really believes he wants to help in this situation makes it a moral resolution that he will never again take a drink while driving. Never. Or that he will never drive a car when he's stuck stone sober. Now, this, is a, this would be a tremendous hardship on a lot of people. Because they don't care about this. The individual who does that does not care. He has a feeling in, of importance or significance in himself often, which makes him say, this accident will never happen to me. Other people may get into trouble, but I won't. And the next thing you know, he's in the hospital. But if we believe in an integrity and in the right of things to be right, then we have to set the complete example. And it won't do us a bit of harm. In fact, we'll all live longer and be healthier. I've nursed too many people through delirium tremens and the, the suicides resulting from it to have very much delusion on this subject. The individual who overdrinks is simply committing slow suicide and is destroying the body and the consciousness and the mind 
which was given to him by a power greater than himself to be used for the fulfillment of a destiny much more important than a wreck on the corner. He has to take these things into consideration. So let's say he will never again take a drink. This is not only a social dedication, but a religious one. That he believes in integrities. That he does not believe in endangering other people for his own pleasure. That he is not going to be selfish enough to take the chance of killing innocent persons. Now, if everyone took that attitude in a nation which is sufficiently civilized and sufficiently educated so that this attitude would seem to be perfectly natural and normal, we'd have a great deal better situation here. We would have less to worry about and less uh, problem to face uh, and the expense of maintaining efforts to control the accident-prone individual. (coughs) The fines won't do any good. He will come right on back. We have a speed limit of 55 miles an hour, and not one person in five keeps it. Now, we may not agree with that speed limit, but it is a speed limit which our society has been invited to share. And until uh, other laws or other arrangements are made, integrity says we should keep it. This is the thing that was, was faced by Abraham Lincoln back in the Civil War days. They told him he should help the, to run Negroes through the underground between the South and the North and help them to escape because they knew he did not believe in slavery. Lincoln said, I can't do it. I cannot break the law which has been established, but I hope to live long enough to change the law. And this is what many people will have to do. We are not going to grow by breaking laws, but by gradually proving that we can improve situations and uh, by having a better way of life for all concerned. This same situation applies largely to our narcotics problem. The narcotics problem would be very much relieved if the average individual, particularly the teenager or the younger person, had the integrity to refuse not only to use, but to peddle it. Because it is against the greater good to the greater number. No individual in his right mind and a right moral character is going to want to give people things that are going to destroy them. They are not going to cater to something that will cause in the end death, suicide, insanity, and the general disorganization of society. In the individual is any integrity is going to be no part of it, and is going to do everything possible not to contribute. And if several thousand young people who are being tempted to become peddlers simply decline to be, and gradually one after another the levels of society reject narcotics as individuals, not because of police, but because they, for the first time in their lives they know what they're up against. Yeah, the traffic would end. No individual in his right mind wants to kill himself unless he has nothing else to do. And if he has nothing else to do, it's high time he found something else to do. You cannot legislate it. But the individual can outgrow his own stupidity in believing that he should do it. And this is the way it can be cleared up. If for one year people refused to use narcotics, the whole industry would fall apart. But as long as we say to ourselves, we will do as we please, we're going to have it because that's what we please to do. But it's hard to understand why educated persons living in a comparatively modern world and with many opportunities and advantages never before available to mankind, should simply, honestly, and sincerely desire to destroy themselves. Why? For a thrill. For something of this nature. The same thing it falls into our moral structure. The morality of the people is falling, and falling seriously. And yet our great ethical institutions have always told us the facts of this. The integrities are clear and evident, but we're not keeping them. 
and yet we are wise enough, old enough, and educated enough to know why we should keep them. There is no excuse for the average educated person, who at least has graduated from high school, to have any doubts or uncertainties about what is right. There may be fine points of distinction and litigation that he may not understand, but in the daily living of his own life, he has sufficient understanding to do what is right if he will sacrifice ulterior motives in his own nature. If he will not try to gain unfairly advantage over others, he will find that it is much easier to keep the golden rule. Each of these different problems that we face today, unemployment, all these things, can be very largely improved by simple integrity. And it's hard to get, because the people who need it worst are the first to deny it. And those who would benefit most from honesty will vote against it. But it can, a vote can't do it. That's another problem. But if a labor union is in problem, uh, its members can vote to strike or not to strike. But if a situation is unreasonable or unfair on either hand, the individual member has the decision in his own hand. <coughs> he can say, I don't agree. And if 50,000 50, or 100,000 members of a union walk out in spite of the union attitude, you'll find the attitude of the union will change very quickly. If the individual's integrities are stronger than the ulterior motives of those regulating so many institutions, those institutions will come down to size and behave themselves. It all depends upon this mysterious, simple little creature that we call man. The human being who has within his grasp at all times the mystery of life. Now, many people are making the mistake, of course, and getting into serious trouble from it, of assuming that they have a very limited time to make these decisions, and also that they are going to be dead a long time, if not permanently, and the point is to have all the fun there is in it right now. Get all you can now, so that you'll have more for your children to fight over when you're gone. <laughs> also more for the government to take away. <coughs> Actually, the problem of this emergency <coughs> is not as acute as we realize. After a very short time, practically everything that we have sacrificed integrity for becomes meaningless. As age advances, possessions become less and less valuable. We become weary of public office. We, all these different things lose all their glamour and all their goodness. And finally, as we go older, we come back to essentials. The essentials of a good life. Quiet, peace, integrity, a few good friends, a close family, and something to do. All the rest of it is very largely an illusion and always was. And the best thinking years of our lives sometimes are damaged by the young, younger years in which we have wrecked health, damaged our characters, and become disillusioned with life. There is no reason why anyone should ever be disillusioned. It's a double negative to begin with. And it is not a condition that can exist. The only thing that an individual really has to worry about is the danger of being ashamed of himself sometime. He cannot be disillusioned because it is his own attitude and his own character which has created the illusions that have been swept away. The only answer is to so conduct himself within the pattern of his integrities that these situations aren't important. In, the, in, in medicine, we have the same type of situation. We have a tremendous overload of technical skills. But we lack what probably what the first physicians of antiquity lacked. But we also lack some of the things they learned and we have forgotten. And that is that healing is very largely integrity. The individual who does not abuse life will have the greatest benefits of life. The average individual can escape most of the problems of 
expensive medication, especially in, older, in later years, by living a moderate life. Dissipation will simply bring him into the hospital sooner. He will find that all of the t ways in which he breaks natural law will continue to contribute to the breaking of himself. So it's must for him to start in at an early date to keep the rules. And if he keeps this, uh, the pattern of integrity, he will greatly reduce his problems of health. He also will discover that mental attitudes are very more important in help. In the health, in this generation, fear is the common emotion. Everyone is frightened. Fear is deadly. And fear can bring more upon the individual in the form of sickness and strife and trial and disillusionment than any other one emotion. In this universe, there is nothing to fear. Everything is part of a plan that is so exact that we really don't have to fear. The only thing we have to do is fulfill. We have to think through things. Instead of being afraid of, afraid of a problem, we should recognize the importance of facing it and solving it. Otherwise, it will become a cause of anxiety. Now, we may also say that supposing the worst happens, and all in spite of all the things that we do, or because of all the things that we do, the end is perilous. <coughs> that we do not come through this emergency successfully, what's going to happen? Well, in the great pattern of things, nothing of importance. The individual cannot destroy that which is not his. He cannot do very much to damage a universe in which life goes on for eternal light years beyond figuring a calculation. He is boasting or very egotistic if he thinks he can in any way embarrass the functions of the universe. He can't. The only thing he can do is to give himself a bad time. Now, this bad time doesn't mean he can destroy himself, because we all believe, I think, with grounds, that within man himself is an indestructible core, which nothing can destroy, even all his own mistakes. We may lose our planet, we might lose our mortgage, we might lose our job, or we might lose our health, but we will never cease to exist. And whatever happens in the infinite future, and regardless of the mistakes we have made, <coughs> we will all be wiser because of what we did wrong. There's no question about it. But we will also have greater inducements to do it right. And sometime in the infinite future of things, there's going to be a world of people who did it right. And there'll be us. We'll be there. Because we will keep on doing it wrong until we can't stand it any longer. <laughs> When we've lost everything we have, then we begin to think, realize what we are. That there is something more valuable to us than all these things. We will come through the fire, and we will discover when it's all said and done, that we lost nothing except errors. We lost nothing but delusions. Nothing but fallacies and fantasies. And that the realities of that great universal plan to which we belong are still flowing along peacefully and pleasantly, and we with them we will gradually grow up. It's hard because most children don't like to grow up. They like to grow out into larger worlds of freedom. They like to do as they please and escape forever guidance of parental powers. But in the universe there is no escape from the guidance of the infinite universal pattern itself. But in that pattern is an inevitable fulfillment all things in the end have to come out right. And the only thing we can do is delay the process. As the alchemist said, art perfects nature. Perfection is ultimate, but it's a long and trying problem unless we take hold of ourselves and, and, and grow a little faster through intent. Some grow in spite of everything, and some grow because of personal effort. Some will wait until the last moment to improve their own natures. Others start intentionally to improve by the control of those fallacies which have already caused them plenty of trouble. So in this particular state of affairs, it is very important that we take what we know and do something with it. And doing something with it means to live within our means 
to keep out of debt if possible because it's a worry, to be very scrupulous in our integrities with other people, be very patient with the mistakes of others, and even be patient with the mistakes of ourselves, but never be patient enough with our own mistakes to, that we no longer desire to correct them. And recognize that every fault we find in any other person may well be also be in ourselves. But we will have the power and the right, if we so desire, to use this magnificent instrument that has been given to us by the infinite to correct ourselves, to grow in grace and glory, to strengthen the eternal principles of integrity with which we have been endowed, and to gradually develop until we can stand forth as a truly human being. For a human being is one in, all, in whom the humanities dominate all other considerations. A human being is one who is simply above compromise, or as Confucius said of the superior man, he said the superior man is one who is incapable of an inferior action. <coughs> we have to fight to keep our principles, but the day will come when these principles will be ourselves, and we will be these principles, and we will every day live according to them. And they will be perfectly normal. And we will enjoy them and enjoy most of all a world that has not been scarred and defaced and destroyed by the cupidity, selfishness, and violence of mankind. The really integrities of life come in the simple life. They are the simple ways of doing things. Simple people doing simple things in kindly ways. These are the things we need desperately now. The person who will keep the pattern, keep the truth, keep the faith, and just roll up his sleeves and do the work that's at hand. There's a great deal of work to be done to pull this civilization out of the doldrums. And the only way it can be done is by honest people doing honest things with every bit of spirit, faith, and hope that they have. This is religion. And this is the condition which undoubtedly is going to bring religion back into the foreground. Because we will never make this achievement unless we begin to have a spiritual realization of life and put the powers of the soul above the appetites of the body. If we can do this and religion becomes an inner strength, a faith against and above fear, something that is going to help us to keep on going, because of principles, because of realities, because of duties, obligations, and opportunities. If we can do these things and live according to them, then our ethical world comes back. We are an ethical people again. We deserve good things to happen. And what we deserve will happen. We can create for ourselves here on this planet even now a better world than the world has ever known before. But to do it, We've got to do things better than we have ever done them before. Otherwise, these good things will not happen. Well, thank you very much, folks.